Okay. Good morning. It's thir Thursday, October 28th, 2021. And we are here as the Baltimore County Board of Appeals in the public deliberation in the matter of case CBA 22005, the appeal of approval of a development plan by the AL ALJ dated May 14th, 2021, where in the red slash green line development plan known as Patapsco Glen 2 was approved uh, and in which there was a combined hearing in which a number of variances were also approved because of issues um, by a local community association. We bifurcated the cases so that we heard the variance case separately to allow participation in the zoning case that we did not in the development plan case. So we will talk about the development plan case first. Um, and as I see it, there were a number of issues raised by the appellant regarding notice um, and also by the Greater Patapsco Community Association regarding standing to participate. Um, I'm going to start with the standing issue first. The Greater Patapsco Community Association was not an appellant in this case. They did not file an independent appeal, nor did they file a timely motion to be joined as an appellant. Uh, and they cite the broad rules in administrative cases where we've allowed participation. But in this case, unlike in the Crown Development case, we are guided by a statute which really, really limits appeals to people who follow the statute, file the appeal, file the notice, file the petition, none of which the association did. Um, Mr. Bell, Mr. Lauer, your views? You can go for it. Mr. Lauer, you can go next. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, I agree with um, your uh, previous um, seizure, or, uh, position, I believe, on this matter, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't see that they have standing to participate since they did not um, file the appropriate uh, memorandum, if you will, or appeal, et cetera. So I agree in terms of standing that, that they would. Mr. Bout? I believe so. There, there was talk of the, the aggrieved person standard. Um, and, and that is correct for participation or actually being part of a case in a de novo status or before the ALJ. Um, case in point, if someone brings a case, they can have witnesses or every witness they want to come who feels that they're grieved and things of that sort. The difference here is that we have an appeal of the record appeal nature. So if this case would have been a de novo appeal to this board, it would have been a whole new case and folks could have come and state their opinions. But the difference here is that we were not accepting any new evidence. We were limited to the evidence that was provided below. And I believe part of the reason to have a notice of appeal is to provide 
the other side an opportunity to be on notice as to which issues they have to refute at a hearing. So there was a persons or persons who filed a necessary appeal. They had the opportunity to hire counsel who could have appeared with them or in their stead and they could have argued anything they would like to argue at that time, but they, they appeared um, as the folks who who actually filed the appeal, which makes a different case as to standing. So that's the way I make the distinction in my mind, which I think is supported by the, the more narrow construction of the statute that deals with appeals that is different from standing for participation as an aggrieved person in a de novo hearing. So, so based on those factors, I concur that we were correct until someone tells us otherwise. And by that same analysis, we allowed the association to participate in the zoning case, which we hear de novo. Okay. And, and Ms. Doctor, one more thing. I just, and this kind of dawned on me when I was reading through the arguments that the fact that we're having a deliberation on that argument is premature. Because we already made that decision, such an argument would be done in circuit court reviewing what we already did. So at this point in time, it's not even to say if there's no standing, then there's no basis to represent the argument. So we've kind of done a precursor to a further argument, but I think technically it's not even right for consideration because there's been no motion to reconsider the ruling at this time. So there's that. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, let's move on to Mr. Webb's allegation that he did not receive meaningful notice because of the delay in receiving mail till the day before the hearing. It is my view that had he attended the hearing, having gotten notice the day before, um, he would have been allowed to participate um, because of his proximity and interest in the case and that he was deemed a party to receive notice. Plus, there were also multiple forms of notice. There were signs on the property, it was posted on the website, it was mailed, there were prior informal meetings. I think that there was more than adequate notice. Other people showed up, um, he's part of a community, if not, though he was specific, he's not part of the association, but, um, I think the developer petitioner did everything appropriately and according to the code to give notice in multiple ways. Uh, I would agree, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I reread the ALJ memo regarding notice, and they did review that and said, as you have that there were signs posted, there was a newspaper, there was a website, there were mailings, there were previous previous meetings. Uh, I feel that um, that notice uh, was adequate in this case and do not see um, an issue or problem with that. And um, I concur. I concur. I guess the notice issue, in essence, is a due process issue that we can, we can consider on a different basis beyond the record appeal because we're looking more of a legal issue. But we also have to consider, too, that in order for there to be a determination of notice, which is part of the hearing below, there is a factual finding. And I believe the ALJ's findings in the motion for reconsideration are factual findings established by the record that we too are bound by those factual findings. 
So looking at it both as a due process issue where we can go beyond the facts themselves and looking at it as a record appeal, both in deeming the factual findings of what they are that I, I concur using both of those analysis if there was an argue of which one were to apply procedurally at this time. And then on the development plan approval, all the county agencies either supported it expressly or did not oppose this and found that the development satisfied the code requirements. Um, there was a discussion regarding a master plan conflict. And again, the ALJ found expressly that this site is not an area in which the master plan conf conflict exists. Uh, that it simply did not impact this site. Having listened to the testimony below, the Department of Planning was a little more equivocal, but I think we are bound by the ALJ's findings on this point. I just simply, I would agree, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, found the findings to be sound. I didn't find any arguments to uh, to offset those findings. Uh, Mr. Bell? Um, I always find when we are doing development plans for overturning these is a heavy lift because we are bound by factual findings. Um, and there's been many occasions where I didn't agree with the ultimate plan, but if there was sufficient evidence provided on the record for the fact finder to logically rule in that favor, then that's that, that's what we have. Um, looking at the Elm Street guidance that we have, we uh, have a prima facie case made when we have all the agencies make their testimony. We have found in the past that expert testimony is usually the best way to refute the Elm Street prima facie, but that's not always the case either. Sometimes there is lay testimony in certain circumstances that could do that. But nonetheless, the umpire as to who is the most persuasive is up to the ALJ and deference is given to that. So as long as the record reflects as it does, that there was sufficient evidence for the fact finder to find in that way, we are bound by that decision in keeping with the statute as to the parameters are review and per Elm Street and uh, the side for the mat the master plan uh, alleged conflict, which kind of even goes outside the, the Elm Street. It's almost a different thing. Again, because of our level of review that there was testimony as to the, I think it was the security Boulevard extension and things and whether or not it was part of it. There was specific testimony that was given that the ALJ chose to be credible. And once that has been done, we are also bound by that determination. Therefore, we can find no master plan conflict that would require this to be referred to the planning board. So in short, I almost feel guilty after all the hard work and discussion that's done that we are a bit limited based on Elm Street and to our statutory responsibility as to our level of record review. So I concur being the third. So are we in agreement that subject to whatever we decide on the variances, we're affirming the ALJ on the development plan? I, I'm in agreement, yes. Yes, and yeah. I, I agree with Mr. Lauer and you, Ms. Dobb. And then that is, um, our decision is to affirm the ALJ on development plan approval um, and to move on to the next deliberation in another nine minutes and deal with the variances which will which this approval will have to um, conform to. Okay, I'll see you on the bit. All right, I'll try to get in quicker. 
you're a pro now. Now you know how to do it. It's all okay. Great. We'll reconvene at 10. Thank you. Thank you.